So let's have a look at today's patient then. It's a portable generator, type BEET 1.5-2, manufactured by FEMAC. This company was founded in 1934, lived through the decades of socialist rule in East Germany, but still continues to exist to this day, manufacturing generators and combined heat and power units. This nameplate is that of the synchronous generator, not of the entire unit, but it says that it was made in 1963. The type number of the synchronous generator is EGBS 1.5-2, which hints at a continuous maximum apparent output power of 1.5 kVA, while it should be able to deliver 2 kVA peak for a limited amount of time. Here we see the old company logo, accompanied by the name Finsterwalder Maschinen GmbH in Verwaltung, Machine Works at Finsterwalde LLC, under administration, which hints at the fact that FEMAC existed as a privately owned corporation that was under administration of the East German state. Nameplates on other generators show that the company was transformed into a publicly owned corporation though, while GmbH or GmbH is the equivalent of an LLC, VEB or VEB was the legal form for publicly owned companies in East Germany. And since that state was in love with lengthy, descriptive and overly technical word monsters, this old manual states the full name on its cover. And here it comes. Volkseigener Betrieb, Finsterwalder Maschinen, Aggregate und Generatorenwerk. And in case you didn't know, that's in the GDR or DDR, Finsterwalde Niederlausitz. At first glance, we can see that this device was originally painted green, like a military generator, but was painted over in blue later on. A second spark plug was screwed in in order to close a hole where you would normally find a valve that can be used to vent the engine. The air filter is also missing. This fuel tank is not original and I don't want to reuse it. And that is why this is the first thing that I'm taking off this unit. The tank might still be okay and it seems like there isn't even any rust in there, but I want to find something that looks a little more like the original fuel tank later on. The engine itself will probably remind you of the Zucks two-stroke engines we have encountered in previous episodes. And indeed this is also a single piston air-cooled two-stroke gasoline engine that runs on two-stroke mixture just like the Zucks engines, but this is not a Zucks engine. It is an EL150 engine manufactured by VEB Barkaswerke Karl Marxstadt, often just abbreviated Barkas. Karl Marxstadt, meaning Karl Marx City, was the name of the city of Chemnitz, Saxony, from 1953 to 1990. From today's perspective, I always have to smile when I see that name on old products. It's just so in your face. With the spark plugs removed, I can easily turn the engine, and that is a good sign, of course. But unfortunately, I can't get a spark, and that isn't a good sign at all. Using a new spark plug didn't help as well. I will have to disassemble parts of the engine and do some troubleshooting on the ignition system. But before I will open any of the enclosures, I'm starting to clean the entire unit from the outside, because otherwise I might introduce all that dirt and grime into the engine or electronic system of the generator. So I have to take care of that first. In order to reach various spots around the engine, I still have to remove some parts here though. This coupling rod here connects the regulator or governor to the carburetor. After taking it off, I can also pull the carb off. I block the opening and continue cleaning the engine. I also remove two bolts to take off this guard here and also the muffler that has a different shape than the ones that are normally installed on these EL150 engines. Next, I separate the actual generator and engine from their support structure. It's basically a steel sled combined with carry handles for two people. All parts are cleaned with penetrating oil, steel wool and rags of different kinds. And eventually I also remove three nuts that sit on the three M12 bolts that connect engine and generator. I do that until the engine is loose so I can take care of the issues with the ignition. Before dealing with those problems though, let's prepare something else first that will take some time. The sled and carry handles are painted blue, but I want to restore the entire unit to a shade at least similar to the original green. For that I cover everything in paint stripper. 
and about a day later I can then start to scrape off the old layers of paint. After cleaning off as much paint as possible, as well as the remains of the nasty paint stripper itself, I also do some wire wheeling. Eventually the surfaces are degreased and a new layer of green paint is applied and everything is left to dry for several days. In order to work on the ignition we have to disassemble the engine partially. This housing contains the governor that is supposed to stabilize the rotational speed of the engine. This is necessary to ensure that the synchronous generator works at the correct frequency. When it operates correctly it's supposed to stabilize the alternating voltage at 50 Hz with 5% tolerance. After opening the housing and unscrewing a bolt I can pull out the actual regulator. It's a centrifugal governor similar to the part we found on the Sachs engines of West German production. As the engine spins up the weights are pushed away from the rotational axis. These weights are connected to those coupling rods which in turn move the gas lever on the carburetor. When the electrical load is increased the mechanical load on the engine increases as well. It should then slow down but as the weights start moving back towards the axis the rods push the gas lever and the engine revs up again. Ideally just enough to keep the rotational speed stable. The housing also needs to contain a certain amount of oil and we will have to refill that. Upon unscrewing this cover we are now looking inside the fan guard. The circular part in the middle serves more than one purpose. It's a flywheel that acts as an impeller in order to cool the engine but it also contains permanent magnets and it's rotating around the ignition coil and a few other parts we will see in just a moment. The ball bearing and washer are pulled off and another protective cover is unscrewed. Peeking through these openings you can actually see the components of the ignition system and some maintenance can be done through these holes as well. But we want to inspect everything under here a little more closely so we will have to remove the flywheel then as well. First you have to unscrew this nut here. I don't have a socket that fits on it and that's why I have to use a punch to get it loose. It's not great for the edges on that nut and I wish I had a better tool. I definitely need that for the future. Another special purpose tool that I already have though is this puller. It is definitely needed to get the flywheel off. The standard pullers are too short for this purpose. Someone is selling this exact tool on eBay. It's not cheap though. In here we find an ignition coil, a capacitor and a set of contacts, usually called points. This is an inductor magneto, in German Schwungmagnetzündung, which means as much as rotating magnet ignition. Contrary to its name, an ignition coil is actually more like a transformer with an air gap. It acts indeed much like a flyback transformer. It has two separate windings. One winding is a primary with only a few turns, while the other one is a secondary with many many turns of very thin wire. Explaining how this works is not easy without a proper animation. But if I wanted to do that in simple words I would put it like this. Magnets rotate around a stationary coil and induce a current in it. That current can only flow through the primary winding unhindered as the contacts or points are closed though. A cam on the rotating axle forces the points open though disconnecting the current path. As the magnetic field in the coil's core is collapsing due to the interrupted current path a much higher voltage is induced in the windings and the current wants to arc over to close the circuit again. It's one of the basic principles of electrical engineering. Inductors try to maintain the current flowing through them. But since the secondary has way more turns, the voltage across that secondary is much much higher than that across the primary. The energy stored in the collapsing magnetic field will take the path of least resistance then. And that is the spark gap between the spark plug's contacts. This process repeats itself in every cycle. The capacitor is normally connected between the points and without it the points would burn away bit by bit due to arcing. When the capacitor works properly it will suppress that arc. I'm disconnecting the capacitor to measure if the points still conduct when they are closed. But I basically get an open circuit even when the points are pressed together. That means that the circuit around the primary can't be closed anymore. I also already measured the capacitance of the capacitor and it is still within specifications. I first clean the contacts 
and then I carefully sand off the surfaces with a piece of very fine sandpaper. I don't want to take away more material than absolutely necessary. And after that I screw the contacts back in. Now I will have to adjust the gap between the points when they are opened. This little wrench came with one of the Zux engines. And if I'm not completely wrong, the little gauge on the side of the wrench should be 0.4 millimeters thick and it should fit right between the open points when they are adjusted correctly. So let's reconnect the capacitor and put the flywheel back on. And there you go, we got a spark. In the next step the carburetor is taken apart into all its little components. And after that the parts are shiny again and it almost looks like new. The carburetor is put back together and so is the engine itself. For my another Barkas engine I was able to salvage this steel plate that someone made and it's really great to have that. The carb plus a replacement air filter are reconnected to the engine. And now some new oil is filled into the regulator housing. And I also connect a muffler to the engine. It's not the muffler that came with the generator but it is a muffler for this exact type of motor. As you can see the motor starts, but the governor is not yet working as it should. But I think I simply filled too much oil into the regulator, so I'm draining it again to a certain point. And after a short back and forth, the regulator seems to work fine now. But these engines don't like being operated without a load, so let's continue with the repairs. Getting the engine running is only half the job with these generators though. We have to check the synchronous generator and look inside the enclosure as well. Here we see the brushes of the slip rings and of an additional commutator. Why does the generator even have both? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Inside the enclosure we find a number of electric components, all of which are really dusty. And in order to clean and inspect everything, I disconnect the entire unit temporarily. Other than the dirt, I can't see any obvious problems So, What are these components and what exactly is their job? Well, there will be a detailed explanation in just a minute. After taking off the electric enclosure, I was also finally able to get rid of the old paint job. The new paint will only be applied once we have tested everything. There is little point in painting the synchronous generator if I only have to disassemble it again in the next step. So I put everything back together and it's time for a test under load. As you can see, again, the regulator needs a moment, but now the engine is running smoothly. So with this successful test I decided to complete the new paint job and I must say that I really like this generator. If anyone ever thought that they didn't make good things in East Germany then you should just think about this for a minute. This unit was built 60 years ago yet it could be brought back to life within just a few hours. Nothing about it looks cheap or low quality. But how does this device actually work? What are the electric components we find here 
And what is their purpose? This is a circuit diagram I found in an old menu issued by the manufacturer VEB FIMAC in 1978, 15 years after our unit here was built. Some minor differences are hence to be expected, but what we see here is 95% identical with our generator. This diagram contains a lot of information, like components used, the letters and names of various connections, and whoever drew this tried to group the different components to show where in the device they were located as well. But that doesn't mean that this diagram is particularly well suited to explain the principle of operation to you, and this is why we will redraw this diagram in a step-by-step step approach in just a minute. But first let us identify the components in the diagram and their location in or on the actual device at hand. This complicated looking part is the combination of a single phase synchronous generator and an auxiliary DC generator. It has two slip rings, a commutator and two separate field windings as well as a filter that is integrated into the housing. And that dotted line is that housing. This is a transformer. It was drawn twice because it can be reconfigured for 115 volts by connecting the two primaries in parallel while you would use a series connection for 230 volts. This is a full bridge rectifier that feeds one set of field coils with direct current and it receives its input from the transformer secondary. This is a wire wound potentiometer or rheostat. It is connected between one of the field coils and the commutator. The strength of the current flowing through that field coil can be adjusted manually here. After the load current has passed the transformer primary, it will also pass a circuit breaker and a switch that switches both line and neutral. A voltmeter measures the output voltage at the output side of the transformer's primary and after that it also passes an ammeter before reaching the single electric outlet. This circuit diagram looks more complicated than it really needs to be and the main reason is all kinds of connections run together in this part here that appears like a central switch panel where all connections are also marked. While this particular style of drawing a diagram might have other practical advantages, it is not well suited to explain how the unit works, so let me try to restructure this depiction for you. First of all, let me remove parts that we simply don't have or that are drawn in a confusing way in my opinion. We have a 230 volt system here, so let's connect the primaries in series and also add an iron core here instead of the dotted line. And let me redraw this part like an ordinary transformer with two separate primaries here. Now in German this part is often not even referred to as a transformer, but rather as a Stromwandler, meaning current converter or current transformer. Now it looks a lot like an ordinary transformer, but the idea here is that the load current flows through the primary and that the secondaries will supply a higher voltage to one set of field coils as the load current rises. This is supposed to regulate the output voltage under varying load conditions. These dotted lines represent the generator housing and the enclosure. And let's just draw them as little squares to remove some confusing lines from this labyrinth here. The old diagram also shows a 24 volt DC outlet connected to the commutator and our unit simply doesn't have this outlet so let's erase it from the drawing. Next I disconnect the generator from the other parts and magnify. This wire would lead to the 24 volt connector but it doesn't exist here. This connection is visually irritating so let's erase that for now. This entire part here looks really complicated even though it's actually not. The reason why it looks like that is because we have wires going to the switch panel and then back again while the principal electrical connections here are actually very simple. Ammeter, switch, breaker and outlet can be redrawn like this. The wire wound potentiometer is installed on the front panel. So they put it right next to the meters here in the drawing, but electrically speaking, it's simply connecting the plus pole of the commutator with one end of one set of the field coils. So it can just be put here. One slip ring, and hence our supposed neutral connector, is hardwired to the enclosures. And we can redraw that like this. Let me put the line connection here to create a little more room and now we mirror the transformer connections and draw the connection here to further detangle this maze. The voltmeter is now connected between the output side of the transformer primaries and line. 
the bridge rectifier is connected to the secondary, which is then feeding the second set of field coils. All these random lines here are without function now and they can be erased. Now the only thing left is to connect these components to line neutral. Amp meter and circuit breaker still need to be switched around and now it should be correct. It's still possible that I've confused line and neutral with a component here somewhere, but that wouldn't even really matter for understanding what's going on. The only difference between neutral and line here is that one is connected to the enclosure while the other is not. Believe it or not, but in terms of how the circuit works, these two pictures contain basically the same information. But what is the purpose of all these parts? The meter, switch and breaker are nice to have and their purpose should be clear. The generator would work without them though. In a way the same can be said about these connections here. Important in practice but not important for the principle of operation. The outer set of coils are fed by the transformer secondary, while the inner set is powered by the DC generator that is integrated with the bigger more powerful synchronous generator. However if we would remove these two things as well, all we would have left is an electric outlet connected to the slip rings of the AC generator. If spun up, it would only generate a minimal voltage though, when the field coils are not energized. If no direct current is forced through the field coils, the rotor of the generator is spinning in the weak remnants field only. However, when a sufficiently strong direct current is flowing through the field coils, the stator is magnetized and then the slip rings can supply the line voltage of 230 volts and sufficient current to power equipment. One other option would be to install permanent magnets instead. But the strength of the permanent magnets cannot be regulated in the way the field coils can be regulated. I've talked about this before in my video German Military Generators, where I reverse engineered a generator of the West German Army from that same era. That West German generator had no commutator and only used a transformer to power the field coils while the older models actually used a DC generator only. This particular approach combines both. Many simpler generators will neither have a complicated governor to keep the engine's rotational speed and thus the frequency of the AC generated within such tight margins, nor will they have a transformer to regulate the field coil to stabilize the output voltage. In the end it all depends on how important that stability actually is to your particular purpose. So here we are, the NVA generator is running again. We are not through with East German engines though, since I have a few more of them sitting on the bench and they will appear again in future episodes. For now I just hope that you found this video informative and that you liked this. If that is the case then please give it a like, it would only be fair. If you want to support the production of future videos, please consider making a donation. You can do that via PayPal, a link for that is under the video, or become a supporter on Patreon under patreon.com slash tpai. See you soon.